welcome to our Junior Golf Podcast. My name is Ro Thompson. I'm your host. And man, I tell you, we got a special guest um, for tonight. But before we get into, get, get into it with our special guest, I want to um, put out a couple of announcements. Um, if you are in the Florida area um, and would like to participate, uh, Jim, there, there's going to be a Jim Thorpe Invitational. I believe that location is Orlando, Florida, um, in the month of February. So if you're in the Florida area and would like to participate in that tournament, uh, make sure you go uh, search out, search the uh, Jim Thorpe Invitational. Um, and it's a junior tournament. It's a junior and an amateur tournament that's going to be put on in, in the Florida area. Um, next, the, uh, the Alliance will be hosting a Juneteenth event at the Memorial Golf Tournament in conjunction with the PGA Tournament, with the PGA Tour. We encourage you to come out, bring your juniors, and um, it's gonna be a once in a lifetime experience. And um, so if your summer schedule allows it, please come out and join that Juneteenth event um, in Dublin, Ohio. Um, for those of you that have, have applied for the Mac Champ Invitational in Houston, Texas, be on the lookout for your letters. Um, they, uh, you should see your letters come in within the next couple of weeks uh, for, uh, for uh, your approvals. And so be on the lookout for that. Um, good luck to Awesome. Awesome Burnett and Haven Ward will be participating in the uh, Rolex in Florida um, at the beginning of January. So good luck to them as they travel to Florida in the next couple of weeks. Uh, shout out to Matthew Vitale, who just made the cut at the Drell uh, Junior Classic. And everybody that participated, I think the Matsus were there, uh, the Millers and the Jacksons, and we had a couple other families that was there. Um, good luck to them. I think the, the final round was today. So uh, shout out to them. Um, also, Pfeiffer University is looking for, 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 three, three, uh, for, for eight men and six women to join their golf team immediately. And also Bethune Cookman is looking for three girls to transfer immediately uh, for their golf program. So those are just a couple of announcements that I wanted to make uh, before we uh, get our guest speaker on. And so without any further delay, I want to bring to you the founder of Decade Golf. Let's give it up for Mr. Scott Fawcett. Hey, Scott. Hey, buddy. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I uh, that was quite the uh quite the recap there i like it i like guys that are passionate about uh helping people try to get better at things so that's that's a great uh, great way in for me that's what we're all about man and i know you're about the same thing so man we're just happy to have you on tonight and so um you know before we get into a lot of the specifics about decade golf man tell us about yourself how you got in the game of golf and um you know just give us a little uh backstory uh, Probably like most of us, my, my dad was a golfer. And so I, I grew up playing golf. I'm not a hunter or anything like that. Never been skiing in my life. My dad was a golfer and I, I like being warm. So there it is. And I did play most of the sports growing up all the way through high school and, and went off to Texas A&M and played a couple of years there and then played professionally you know, with some success. But honestly, I, I do think part of why I didn't make it as a younger professional is because so much of what I teach, it does just take a long time. I mean, it's why I called it decades. You're just trying to imply we're going to take decades off your learning curve. So it really is all about just trying to take those same years off of junior golfers learning curves. And like I say, when I got out there and was playing, uh, Chad Campbell and Chris Riley were a couple guys that I traveled with. And I just always felt like I had every ounce of ability as them. But even though I won a few events, I just didn't have anything close to their results. So wound up, uh, you know, eventually going broke or quitting, retiring, whichever one you want to call it. I think right, going right. broke is probably the, the most accurate assessment. So I, uh, I started an electricity company here in Texas back in 2002. But what's funny is I I started playing a lot of underground poker here in Dallas and, and Chris Como, obviously Tiger's yeah. eventual instructor. He and I became friends in this, uh, in this uh, underground poker game. Right. And then I went back and started, I, mean, I started working on my golf game with him at the time and got to where I was playing pretty good golf. And a lot of it was just, I was just applying just basic poker math and mindset wow. and expectations. Like, wow. so even though I'm pretty good with math, it had never really dawned on me to look at golf as a math game. Right. And, you know, I don't want it to ever sound too intimidating. The, the math is, it's about sixth grade level math. It's not uh, real challenging stuff. It's funny when people want me to come to, uh, to, to, MIT or and when I'm having a discussion with Mark Grody, who's a dean of an Ivy League business school, I'm like, guys, this is really basic stuff that I did. They're going to they're going to talk my face off. But 
really just using my my ability as a player to uh, you know and then then the math to supplement the thought process and the mindset it really was uh just just a natural evolution and progression for me and then luckily for me after i kind of did all this work with kind of creating decade was will zalatoris just happened to be a junior golfer at my home course and only because of injury i caddied for will when he won the texas salmon u.s junior applying these math-based principles for the first real time wow and uh you know then deshambeau was at smu here in dallas and he so he's the next guy that i worked with and next thing you know i'm on junior golf podcast right <laughs> strategy expert <laughs> there you go hey listen man that's awesome man so 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 give us the backstory of how you know when it finally hits you that man this could this could probably work for some for some players well honestly it was so when i was caddying for zal torres at the mm -hmm. texas am i mean at the time again he was 3300 in the world in the junior golf rankings like he did a few amazing things like qualifying for the u.s junior really young but then after that he was kind of just some unfulfilled potential, really. Right. Um, and just going out there and counting for me, like I say, at the time, he had never beat me in a single round of golf. And, you know, we hadn't played a whole bunch. But we'd played a decent amount. Right. And, you know, when I'm counting for him, if I had won the Texas Am, I would have been excited. I mean, like, I played good. But then theoretically, that should have been a very simple thing to do just based on the fact of what he did. And, and it just really was taking the emotion of having to hit the shots out of the equation the right. emotional attachment to the to the end result um for a kid like will honestly trying to get him to everything that he was always playing before is like well if i get top five in this it'll qualify me for that or top three gets me in that it was just always it was never any process uh oriented goals like just let me make a good decision and shot on this one and then we'll go try to do that again gotcha. and again a lot of what i say it is extremely straightforward sports and golf cliche but i do think that one thing that i've done differently is as a former lunatic player is just literally getting the the emotion that that is attached that makes us you know all feel that way that that attachment to outcome just removing that by caddying instead of playing really is everything that i that i tried to do with my players and that i think really is different about how i teach this stuff that's good that's good scott so scott give us give us an idea about the interworkings of decade you know how does it work give us like the, the best scott fawcett explanation of, of decade golf honestly it's super aggressive off the tee i want you hitting driver almost everywhere that you possibly can um and again this is what's funny like a, a guy like deshambeau who you know i still work with him you know through through como chris como is his instructor now and through him i try to get ideas out there and at the pga that morikawa won uh bryson just laid up off the tee too much he dropped back to three wood way too often even though obviously he's been on this quest for distance and everything he was just he hit way too many three woods and then winged foot was just the perfect place to really explain and go deeper. Like, dude, if it's a, if it's a driver on five, it's a driver on 15. Wow. And he definitely just, there's just times you feel like you're playing smart by dropping back. You're like, I'm really thinking I'm strategizing here. Right. And so you tend to overthink a lot of things, especially off the tee. And it's like, man, pretty much you should probably be hitting driver unless it's obvious, it, you know, completely ridiculous that it's not a driver. Or I should add the whole is a, you know, Bryson likes to draw the driver. So dog leg to the right, that would make a draw hard. That would be a reason he would potentially drop back. Right. Um, but then that's just what was so funny going into Wingfoot and just really explaining like, no, I'm serious. Like it's driver everywhere. everywhere. And then he actually overdid it at Wingfoot because holes two and eight both were dog leg rights with a decent sized trees in the inside of the dog leg. Gotcha. And those really were the only eight, you know, he, he had a bad drive basically every single day on those two holes. And gotcha. it's like, well, no, those actually, he should be dropping back to three with the plate to the corner, but I'd rather him be, I would rather you be over aggressive off the tee uh, okay. than not. So that's step one. step one. And then the challenge with approach shot strategy and just giving generic sound bites is the, is the fact that golf is the only sport that's not played on a uniform field of competition. So if, if I tell you that I was at the top of the key last night and the, the guard switched from the low post, if that even makes any sense anymore, and I shot a turnaround jumper, you kind of know what I'm talking about. But if I told you I was 147 in one fairway, should I aim at the flag? You're going to be like, well... How big was the green? What was the hazard? Like, there's just more stuff to it. Right. But the main thing that I really do think people need to understand is just instead of thinking, where's the place to miss it? Because that's basically always towards the middle of the green. 
I was thinking of where's the place to miss it. It really doesn't make any sense. The real question is how much do I not want to be short-sighted? So if a pin's on a front left, you want to be in your practice round, just kind of looking at what's short left. And again, in decade, we have these uh, ways that we rate hazards from the easiest up and down ever is minus two to a water hazard is plus three. Gotcha. So it's just a scale in there. Um, but then we're working from the side of the green that the hole is located closest to. So we're always moving towards the middle of the green. Okay. And again, the, the easiest way generically, again, this, man, I do hate making specific statements because if a green's really wide, the middle of the green's usually not the play, you know, no yeah. matter what the club is. But if you're playing a course with average size greens and the okay. weather is average, you know, which is about 20 to 23 yard wide greens, that's pretty average. Okay pretty aggressive with your gap wedge and lowers correct splitting them at the pin in the middle of the green with your like seven eight nine iron and then middle of the green really with like six iron and longer okay i mean generically it's pretty good advice unless the greens are really big that's okay. kind of the only place that that starts breaking down but again also i should say you know if the, some of these kids hit their, their gap wedge is 120 130 yards obviously okay. I mean, there's a chance that if it pins on the left-hand side and it's only a few yards from a lake, you probably should be aiming at, you know, six, seven yards right of that pin, which again, that's why it's, it's just difficult to make generic or, you know, specific statements, but aggressive off the tee, quasi conservative into the greens and then become a really good lag putter. I mean, that's, it's so funny because there's always a point in time where somebody in my seminar will be like, well, don't you have to be a good lag putter to do this? I'm like, no, you have to be a good lag putter to be good at golf. And once you understand how important speed is, again, especially as a junior golfer, that's the thing that plagued Zalatoris was just kind of some poor putting. Once we really started working on speed and speed only, right. he got out there last year in his rookie year on the PGA Tour, and he was negative 0 0.06, which is basically dead on PGA Tour average. Wow. which he does struggle inside of 10 feet, which is totally fine because he's got great speed, which makes him make a disproportionate amount of putts from outside of about 15 feet, not three putt too much. And he's able to be an average PGA tour putter, which is really, really, really good. And so once people understand that it's not your, it's just never your, your line. I mean, obviously junior golfers, you've got to be yeah. working on your stroke and working on your line, but that will just kind of naturally happen as you're, as you're working on your speed. And so having at home, maybe a putting arc or something like that, where you're working on your stroke away from the course, right. you're grooving your stroke there. And then once you're out at the practice screen, mm -hmm. then you're just rolling speed drills, just, just up and down the sides of the greens. So we're aggressive off the tee, somewhat conservative into the greens, really good lag putting. And then on chip shots, just don't miss the green. I mean, honestly, it really is. You will get, a certain amount of chip shots up and down right just by accidentally chipping it closer by accidentally making an eight or nine foot putt again you have to work on your chipping but the most important thing is to understand you just you can never you can't offset missing the green as, as many times as junior golfers do you just can't overcome that big of a, a, a negative by getting it up and down a whole bunch it's just not how it works that's good. All right, Scott. So, so Scott, what type of impact have you seen on a lot of the, you know, players that use decade? You know, I know you, you mentioned Will, but there's a cup, there's a lot of other players that use the, the system. You know, what, what type of impact have you seen since a lot of players start using it? Well, really the most important thing, and I think that it's okay to let kids know this, but, um, the, the main reason that this works so well, <clears throat> excuse me, and has this impact on these players is, is as a male, our brains really aren't finishing developing until we're about 25. Right. It's why they, an 18 year old makes a better soldier than I would. They're like, they're shooting at you out there. I'm out. Your brain just doesn't have that frontal lobe. The last portion of the brain developed that, that takes the information from everything else and yeah. then allows you to make a good decision. So it's, it's, it's important for kids to understand. I'm not saying you're dumb. Right. I'm just right. saying you're bad at making decisions. Maybe you've noticed. Right. And once they, yeah. once they can kind of like be somewhat objective and be like, yeah, no, I can see that. That probably sounds true. Well, then let's put a system in place. And again, I would not have thought if, if you'd asked me six, seven years ago, when I first started this, I'd been like, it's all the math, the math, the math, the math. Mm -hmm. And now removing myself, even if the system was bad, just systematizing the decision-making process would make it good. Yeah, now, 
it is great that it's based in math. We've I've got probably six different U.S. Junior and U.S. Amateur champions, six or seven NCAA individual champions. Like it's been ridiculous. Right. Once you just stick a functioning brain in these kids' heads, <laughs> how how much they can dominate their 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 opponents. Right. And it really is. And again, it is just kind of fun because I do think that the most the 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 thing that I struggled the most with was just learning how to make decisions. Add to that that I was a hothead. I mean, again. I was a total lunatic on the golf course and, and I never realized, well, I can, I can fix that. I always right. just thought, well, that's just who I am. It's in my DNA. My dad was kind of a hothead on the course. So I am too. Once you kind of empower yourself to say, you know, maybe I could do something a little bit better here and actually, it, you know, be calm. And I talk about meditation a lot and having guys like Tiger and LeBron and Jordan and Kobe talk about meditation as a huge part of why they were so good under pressure yeah. i mean i just that's the kind of message that i'm trying to bring to the younger kids because we've got to, we've got a lot of issues to work through in this world right now and and having a bunch of calm people would be a great way to start that's for sure that's, that's true scott that's true so scott take us back to that moment you're, you're sitting at home watching the masters and i think uh brando chamblay starts talking about you take take us back how, how did that moment feel what was that like it's pretty crazy, honestly. Like, again, if you took me back six, seven years ago, I'd have been like, you know, this thing's it's kind of neat. I mean, again, like I've got Zal Taurus and we're going to do, you know, do some cool things or whatever. But if you, I, it never would have crossed my mind that they would be talking about me and Decade on live from the majors and that Navalo and Chambly, those guys would actually be saying it as I'm watching Will, this kid I've known since he was nine, you know, try to win the Masters. And honestly, he made about, I think he made about a six foot putt or so on number nine to turn. And I, I honestly thought he was going to win because he and I have discussed how you play that back nine so many times. He knows exactly. And he, he hit the shots, you know, you just need an extra kind of lucky putt or two yeah. to fall. And he just didn't have, there was a putt on 12 that, uh, that just, he hit a good putt. It just stayed right on the, on the left lip, but it's crazy. I mean, honestly, it's one of those, I, I feel like that's maybe why I've gotten a little bit more confident in talking about like the brain developing, like, I love Will like a son, but I know he's just a dumb little kid. Right. Like you watch some of these other guys out there and you're like, they must be just amazing humans. And don't get me wrong. Will is an amazing human, but he is just, a. I just, I do know for a fact, he is just a kid at the end of the day. And so to watch him, like, my God, you almost, you actually almost won the masters. <laughs> like the fact he was playing and it was hilarious to me. And then like, you literally almost won. And made it, you know, 1.2 million. I mean, that putt on 18 was worth a, a Lamborghini. Yes. <laughs> like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, you've literally got to be kidding me. It's just incredible to watch. It's been pretty funny. That's good. So, Scott, we, we have some uh, we have some listeners, uh, some junior parents, juniors that are passionate about winning. Um, if 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 they take if you, do you truly feel if they take advantage of decade, which is a system, do you feel like they can make some improvements and strides in their game? I, I really do. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's tough because I never want to, I feel like a, a used car salesman or a snake oil salesman, but right. I, I, we're, we've got a, a couple of deals we're actually working on with uh, co-branding with other companies. And so we've had to, I don't want to say take this more serious. We've had to take it a little bit more serious for the last few months to where we're actually like looking at metrics of what do our players do and, we took, and I don't remember because I had them run it a few different ways, but we took basically the first three rounds that people enter in the decade app. Okay. And we took that as their baseline average score. So just every single member's first three rounds. And then I think we think we took rounds 11, 12, and 13. Okay. So they'd entered, you know, so we're just trying to put some time in between to watch and learn the system. Right. And I think our players average improvement, I think it was 4.6 shots, but we even had 20% of, of the people improved by like eight and a half shots. Wow. I mean, it really is just, it, it really is incredible because when you think about, um, you know, when you finish around a round of golf and you think I should have shot lower. Yes. It's never because you think, I should have hit that three iron close, or I should have made that 30 footer. It's always, I shouldn't have made that bogey with that sand wedge. I shouldn't have tried to make that 18 footer and jam it five feet by and miss it coming back. And I shouldn't have tried that flop shot and miss the green and then didn't get it up and down and made double. Like there's four shots right there that you, you, you know, you're just like, I should have shot instead of 79 today, I should have shot 75 or whatever that number is. Those are the four shots. And what's, 
what is crazy, honestly, again, because I play this internet smart guy, which like I've got like the imposter syndrome because I'm like, I'm not that smart. I do more dumb stuff on a day on a daily basis than you could possibly imagine. But I used to, when I was playing professionally, would do this dumb stuff every single day. We would go to Chili's for dinner and we would all talk about all the dumb stuff we did that day. Oh, and then I would never think about it again. Just, oh, you won't believe what I did on six or this and that and the other. And then the next day, do the same thing. Like, like just a, like like they you just do that yesterday <laughs> it is i mean honestly it, it is yeah. comical looking back at it and and trust me the only reason that i know i'm not i'm not alone in this i'm not a unicorn is every single time as i'm talking to like many tour guys and college guys and i say i specifically say the 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 bar at chili's because they're all like well that's where we go every single day after a college event and it's just comical to watch them smile because they're like yep that's pretty much all we do at dinner every single day but then we never try to stop it's it really is bizarre um that it took systematizing decision making again that's what every company's handbooks are like we are systematizing our decision making process right and the fact that it really did take data like everybody's got their pre-shot routine and but it still is always kind of mystical and no one has specifically said these are the things you're analyzing. This is how you're analyzing them. This is how you're assigning a little bit of a value to these things. Right. And this is how you're now picking your actual target. Right. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I'll say along those lines is I do believe that, <clears throat> excuse me, the vast majority of outlier shots come from just an inconsistent thought process. So let's even pretend that pin is again on the left-hand side of the green. Mm -hmm. You've got a seven iron and you're aiming towards the right of the pin but then you're hoping you pull it close. Like people do that seven or eight times around. And it's funny because whenever I make that, I kind of draw that scenario out, everybody kind of laughs just like you did. Like, oh yeah, I do that all the time. Right. You've never once sat on a driving range and thought, I hope I pull it 15 feet. Right. And so we get out on the course and so we're kind of not really playing aggressively to our spot and then just trusting the shotgun shot pattern right. that will accidentally make some pull. I mean, but you don't aim right and then kind of hope you pull it. It's again, it's really so obviously dumb. It's incredible. But I, every single tour player, again, tour player that I work with, they all laugh when I get to that. And so the point of the story is nothing more than even just taking the decision making process and systematizing it to a, a concrete decision. Right. You can still do that, but at least you know why you've made this decision. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to hopefully play more aggressively to that spot, which is again, just a quote from Tiger where. They asked him if he plays aggressively or conservatively. And Tiger said, oh, I play aggressively, but I play aggressively to my spot. Right. So wherever I choose that spot to be, and that might be on the more, more on the conservative side, but I'm still playing aggressively to Good that spot. spot. And I'm like, that's it. That's incredible. That is, I do believe that's, that's one of the big differences. And then just this idea of like saying, don't go left or don't go right. You've just never sat on a driving range and thought, don't go left here. Right. Well, that's obvious. That's why we've, whatever that reason is, is why we've now chosen our target that accounts for don't go left. And now you play aggressively to that spot. I, I do believe that basically all outlier shots come from those two things. And so that's just, just little things like that, that you're just trying to clean up with players at a younger age than has been done historically. And uh, okay. yeah. Okay. Well, listen, I'm telling you, we, we're, we're all in, we got the system. <laughs> we are ready to implement the system. So take us through a, a cliff note, uh, if you will, uh, Scott. Let's say I, I know I got a practice round coming up. Let's say tomorrow. I've got a tournament next week. Tell, give us like a, the cliff notes of, you know, when you're out on the course for the practice round, what type of notes should you take? You know, when you get ready to print up your yardage book, when you get ready to play the tournament, just kind of give us a little cliff notes on that. Sure. I do believe that getting good at using Google, it used to, you have to use Google earth, but now just even searching in Chrome and you use maps in Chrome and you can click into the satellite. Right. I do think that getting into the satellite images and looking at the course, again, I'm coming into this, assuming you're wanting to shoot your lowest score possible. Correct. This is the work that I did for Zalatoris when he won the Texas amateur and the U S junior and every single PGA tour event. And it, so this is the work with that being the end, you know, the, the end goal. Right. So you do have to spend, I don't know, an hour, just kind of checking out four or five minutes on each hole, just kind of checking out 
each hole measuring you, they've got these measuring tools. And if you Google N as in Nancy, N G C A A driving video, if you Google that, there's a, a 30 minute video on YouTube, uh, from me. That's, that's just out there for free. Obviously it's on YouTube, right. um, where I'm talking about T shot strategy, Correct. but then at the 17 minute mark into it, I even show you how to use the, the measuring tools in Chrome okay. because just to get in there and, and then you start to see like, okay, this green's pretty big. And you start to see some standardized numbers that you're looking for. And, and especially like I, I tell people to practice into like a 65 yard wide grid on a driving range. Right. And then you start laying those same things out onto the course. Mm -hmm. So if I've got a term that I'm preparing for, I'm getting into the satellites, I'm laying those things out. Let's call it an hour, uh, whatever. And just saving them, saving them into a PowerPoint as a PDF. And then just on my phone, kind of looking at them. So now I'm out there at the course okay. and you can start to use those, those, those little grids that you've laid out from the satellites. Right. And you'll be amazed when you're standing on the tee, you'll be able to see the lips of the bunker or whatever it is. And so now you're, you're, you're kind of understanding why you're picking these very specific targets. And it's funny because looking back at it in my twenties, I hated playing in golf terms. The, the few golf terms I played in on the corn ferry tour, or PGA yeah. tour, um, I didn't like using caddies because I didn't want to tell them what I was going to do because I knew I probably wasn't going to do it. Like I just felt like I would look like I didn't belong. Right. Um, and I never would have thought about that before, but that's why. But now when you're out there playing your practice rounds, you're understanding I'm, I'm picking that left lip of the bunker and I'm picking that because I've got a 60 yard wide shot pattern or whatever it is with the driver. And it just allows you to start playing more aggressively. So, but the most important thing is, and, and again, the reason I bring up all that work at your range and even looking at your home course like this right. is now you're going to go to a tournament course. Right. And, and let's just use a hole that everybody knows uh, number 18 at TPC Sawgrass where the players championship okay. with the lake on the left. Right. You may not have that exact hole at your home course, but yeah. you've got something with a lake on the left. And then once you measure out this grid, you know, this kind of like landing zone, if you will, like a touchdown area right. that's specific to your driving shot pattern, there's no reason to think don't go left anymore. And you kind of understand why you're choosing these targets. And so you, you want to be playing on a daily basis at your home course, thinking about these things, because then what you're trying to do is find intimidating shots on the tournament course. Mm -hmm. You're trying to find those to now relate them back to something you play every day. And that's going to give you a lot more confidence in order to, again, just really attack those, those targets. And, and again, play with a lot more confidence. So, so, so actually to finish up your question, though, I'm yeah. sorry. I was like, what was the question? COVID COVID's got me a little dumb here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. It's right. funny. I'm in my head. Like every once in a while I'm talking, I'm like, I feel like I'm rambling here, but um, so you want to go out there with some semblance of an idea from the satellites of what clubs we're going to be hitting off the tees. And then around the greens, you just want to see where the, the chipping collection areas are, where you, where's a tough place to get it up and down from. Okay. But then really you want to roll speed putts. I used to always stand basically in the middle of the green right. and I would just take four balls and I would roll one to the front left, one to the front right, one to the back right, one to the back left. Okay. And then I would go to the front left one and I would putt the one putt over to the front right and then I would put those two up to the back right, and then I would put those two across to the back left. So you've kind of put like the clock essentially. Gotcha. So you put from the middle of the clock just out to the edges, and then you kind of gather them up around. Okay. And that kind of, you'll start to get a pretty good feel of speed and just rolling a bunch of 25 to 40 ish foot putts from corner to corner. You know, so if a green is 20 yards wide, which is pretty average, that'd be about 60 feet. Right. So not quite the width of the green, but you're just kind of rolling putts all around the edges because again, I, I, I don't want to overemphasize how important lag putting is, but one of the best quotes from Tiger that I got from both Maverick McNeely and Joseph Bramlett um, was them saying when they were playing with Tiger one time that they asked him why he was the best player ever. And he was like, this is the best lag putter ever. He's like, if I got myself in trouble, I could just kind of dump it somewhere towards the middle of the green. And that's the thing that I'll agree with where it's like, again, I'm saying this half tongue in cheek and it is somewhat relative to your ability, but just hitting the green, honestly, typically is not that hard. It's right. when you're trying to do too much that hitting the green becomes difficult. And so if you find yourself in a weird spot and you can just get it somewhere on the green out of the rough, or if you've just got like you're in the trees and you've got some sort of a hallway to some part of the green, you know, but, Oh, I could try to shape it and get like a 20 footer for birdie. Like the difference in being 20 foot and 40 foot is basically nothing. If you ever hit the trees, and leave it in the trees so you really just want to you do want to be working on that lag putting because it supports everything else so much it's unbelievable right 
and, and Scott, you know, one of the videos that I, that I, you know, that I've watched so far, because I watched all the, the intro videos, one of the, one of the things that really stood out to me is, for example, when you're going toward that front pin placement, you, you, you said that 80% of the shots that people hit always end up short. And it's, so unbelievable. it's just better to add whatever your distance is, add what, six, eight yards to that to make sure you get it to the pin. Is that, is that about accurate? Ish, essentially, yeah. it's, it's a really incredible number, honestly. So from 161 to 180 yards in the fairway. So if it's 170 to a back pin and it's 170 to a front pin, like we're, so we're taking the length of the shot only, and they're all from the fairway. They hit 71% of the greens to back hole locations and only 57% of the greens to front hole locations. We're talking about PGA Tour players here. Right. And again, to hit 14% fewer greens for no reason other than the ball, the pins on the front, right. like that is just incredible. And that's again, because we're all playing for this like 80th percentile shot. So for me, if I hit, if I hit an eight iron good, it's about 165, maybe 167. Right. It's never going 172, but I'll hit a whole bunch 155 shoot. I'll hit some even 150. So we're all playing for that like 80th percentile in, in contact and in, in distance even a tour player. I mean, so a tour player's 80th percentile is closer to his average than a 10 handicap, but they still, you just to front hole locations. Again, this is where it's been fun. I've been saying this for, for a number of years, you know, y'all suck to front hole locations and you had Lou Stagner on your podcast, you know, back this summer. And yep. this is all the numbers are just based in, I mean, just pure expectation management. I mean, again, there's just a point where like, 14 percent fewer greens it's, it's kind of like the chip shots you can't get it up and down enough to offset missing the green with chips you can't make enough birdies to offset hitting 14 percent fewer greens in regulation you just can't do it and so what i try to tell people is even by sending it quite a bit long you're still going to have your miss hits that will accidentally be close you'll still make your birdies but you're going to be two putting from long way easier than you're going to be getting up and down from short and then the most important thing for people to understand, the other stat is just that as your scoring average improves through the 70s, 70 to 80% of your improvement comes from avoiding bogey, not making more birdies. Right. That was you, the other thing that, that shocked me. You said, don't focus on making birdies. That, that was the other thing that you said. It's crazy. I mean, again, like basically, unless it's a par five, I mean, pretty much tell you you're going to make par on the hole, like <laughs> before you even tee off. Right. And it's just, it is funny at the, a 340 yard hole on tours average score is 3.86. So if you're standing on a 340 yard hole, guys like Cameron Champ and Bryson, they can drive that green. So that's a hole where you would be thinking, I got to get a look at birdie here. And it's just incredible. They, they, they 3.86, you can go back a full hundred yards. So a 440 yard hole and the scoring average barely goes up two tenths of a stroke. I mean, wow. unless you can get it putting, it basically doesn't matter. You're making par. And so the only place you can really get it putting are going to be holes that are about 320 or less or par fives. And by putting, I mean, like in one shot less than regulation. Right. I mean, and that's, I hate saying it that way because I don't want people to get on par fives and, make a par or heaven forbid a, a bogey and be like walking off thinking, Oh, I got to make birdie there. Like, no, right. you just need to birdie some of those. You don't need to birdie them all. Don't do anything dumb trying to force a birdie from out of position on a par five, but yeah. That's good, Scott. So Scott, as you know, uh, we, we've got, a, we, you know, this is going to go out to a lot of junior parents. Um, you know, the rising cost of golf is way high, sky high. And um, I wanted to ask you, um, you, would you happen to have, any programs that our parents can take advantage of uh, to be a part of Decade Golf? Because I'm, I'm, I'm hearing some great things. I, you know, we're already in the program, but I want, I want parents to experience their juniors getting their scores down. You know, we, we all know you, you know, you got to practice, you know, you got to go to lessons and you got to be in big tournaments. But I think one of the missing implements, you know, one, one of the missing pieces is course management. So what do you have that can possibly help our junior parents with uh, ex the expenses of the, uh, the decade program? Absolutely. We'll do, we'll definitely do a deal, whether that we do that. Um, I'm trying to think of, I feel like I've got it set up already. A code, a, a sales you, code you that is decade 75. 
I'm it's, sorry, this COVID, I've got, I'm so, so yeah. dumb right now. I, I know I, we've got decade 150. So all lower ca yes, case, decade, decade 150. 150. That's it. If you use that code at birdiefire.com, um, and it'll be somewhere along, we're, we're redoing the websites right now. It'll be somewhere along in the sales uh, funnel. I do believe this. So, so we initially, we were trying to build yardage books that could rival uh, green books, but from the satellites, like right. because they actually do have elevation data. It's pretty impressive. Wow. It wasn't quite good enough. And then as we started making them, like, you know what? We could just include these for free because if you're going to be playing tournament golf, you really should be using yardage books. I mean, okay. You have to have as much information as possible. You simply wouldn't find a PGA Tour player playing a golf tournament without a yardage book. So you need to start learning how to use these because you can track notes and that'll help you figure out exactly how far you hit your clubs and on and on and on and on. So our decade, our, our normal uh, elite program comes with four free yardage books per paid month. So it literally should be enough to cover your, your yardage book. So normally that, that app is $200 for six months and then it goes to $20 a month. But if you use that code decade 150, it'll give you a full year for $150. And shoot, with the price of these yardage books that I see out there, they're 25 or 30 bucks for kind of the cheap ones at the course. And they're usually not any good. Hey, like hey, it's guys, insane. The, the ones that the ones that I've seen, some of those yardage books, they go from 50 to $80 a book. Oh, that's what I'm saying. The, the track, I mean, they're beautiful books. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, they're, they're immaculate. Mine, <laughs> if you want a piece of art, go buy that thing. If you want something that's really functional and free, I'm your guy. Right. Um, yeah. So we really, I, I really do. There's so many mistakes that could have, I shouldn't say mistakes. There's so many things that could have helped me be a couple things, a lot better player when I was a kid and in college right. and just a lot healthier mentally. Like I really was a lunatic. Like I'm not just playing a role there. I really was insane. Right. And so I didn't come anywhere close. And again, I know parents are frustrated watching kids every single day. Like, gosh, why don't they figure this out? It's because of that lack of a functioning prefrontal cortex. It really is because of that. And so setting these kids up with, like I say, a system in order to make better decisions. And then hopefully in case you are buying yardage books, the decade app at $150 for a year. So basically free, you know, half price, it should pay for itself. And then all you've got to do is you just print them at home on a, on, on a normal, if you've got a double-sided printer, we've got a very easy PDF that prints them. And if you just have a normal uh, printer that only prints on one side, it's kind of a pain in the butt, but I show you in the app how you can take the pages and you turn them and flip them and put them back into the tray. Right. And like I say, then you're printing a yardage book for free and they're, they're, they're functional information of what a tour player would want you know again there's a lot of fluff in a lot of the other books that really is just distracting more than anything and what we've tried to drive is just nothing but a really functional yardage book with exactly everything that you need that's good. that's good scott hey listen man this has been great so scott before we open it up uh can you hear me scott yeah, no, I can. You first so, were yeah, saying. Before we, before we open it up for some Q&A from uh, some of the live uh, uh, members that are on tonight, um, what's, how, can, how can everybody follow you on social media? <laughs> Hopefully they don't know. <laughs> Twitter's just, I'm trying to do more stuff on Instagram. It's decade underscore golf, I believe. Okay. And then if, on Twitter, just Scott Fawcett, F-A-W-C-E-T-T. -T. Okay. Uh, my lesson is a uh, website is playinglesson.com plural, not pluralized. Um, but if at this point, luckily for me, this is, I, I, again, I think that it's hilarious that I'm actually teaching course management, but, uh, at this point, if you just Google decade golf, you'll, you'll find it. I really did actually intentionally, I, I'm a big Tony Robbins fan, big, you know, self-empowerment guy. Yeah. And, uh, I really did whenever I was making this, like I, I really was just making it for my game. And then only because of working with Dave Shambonex and some people tell me like, you should turn this into some sort of product. I'm like, yeah, I guess I could. And I was like, I'm going to just Tony Robbins this thing to death. We're going to have a six step acronym. Like, cause I was literally, my goal was to basically replace the word course management with decade. And yeah. like, I can't believe it's actually worked, but it, it really is a testament to how much the system again, just helps these young players just make a coherent decision again that's why companies have handbooks like we got one guy that was really good at doing something so we're all going to try to do the same way that he did right there you <laughs> replicate go. that process so listen we're looking forward to it because i know it's i think it's going to help my son 
And I know it's going to help a lot of juniors that are struggling and, you know, really to get to that low 70, high 60 mark. So I think it's going to really help. So yeah. we've got, we, we're going to open it up. We're going to open up the lines. Um, we've got our first question coming in from Darren. I'm going to uh, unmute Darren. Uh, Darren, go ahead and unmute your mic. So we got Darren Carpenter coming in from Philly. Hey, Scott, how you doing? Thanks, thanks for being on tonight. How you doing, bro? Absolutely. I'm perfect. I'm perfect. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Yeah, definitely. So um, I missed it a little bit earlier. I was a little bit in and out. So with your program, I um, mean, I heard you talk about the yardage books, but is there, how does the, how does the program get explained to the player? Um, are there videos? You yeah. Know, if, you, if, if we get to sit on the videos, do you do webcasts? You know, talk to me a little bit about the logistics of how this works. Yeah, so when I first started doing this, again, Jason Enloe, who was the SMU coach that recruited DeChambeau and was there, he told me, he's the guy that said, you should turn this into like a, a seminar, like an indoor seminar. Um, and it had to be indoors because the NCAA, well, then they banned me from doing it, which then was why I was like, okay, well, now I'm going to, they, they being the NCAA banned me after Bryson won the NCAAs and U.S. Amateur, they wow. called the decade seminar an unfair competitive advantage. And I was like, okay, now what? And that's when it was just like, well, you know what? The, I could recreate. I mean, all I'm doing is voicing over a PowerPoint in my seminars live, in my live seminars. And so all I did was just sit down. Again, if you're looking for uh, video quality, like go watch the No Laying Up stuff and the Random Golf Club. There, they make amazing videos. It is me voicing over some PowerPoints, just giving you the information. So uh, when you get the app, I would I just tell everyone honestly because I really did put some effort into into the foundations order. So still even if you get the elite version you still just i say watch it the, the difference in foundations and elite is foundations gives you a little bit of content every three weeks it forces the player to slow down and really digest that month's information before initially i was going to give it out every single month um we started selling this on valentine's day right before the pandemic started and just to give people something else to do during the pandemic, instead of being every month, I sped it up to two weeks. Right. Then when it came time to slow it back down, I was like, well, a month seems like forever. So I, I, but I did keep it at three weeks, even though I've still just have it labeled month one, two, three, four, five, six. I do though. I love the order that that's in. So when you get the app, you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a foundations tab and then you just watch it month one, right in order. Or if you get uh foundations it, it'll just come to you and, and and again i think that's a viable option also and again that i'm pretty sure decade 75 as the next question's coming in I'm, i'll see if i can double check if that works um or not um lost my training i, I distracted myself there <laughs> we were talking about um we were talking oh right 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 foundations has yeah. one free yardage book a month so you'll get free six free yardage books uh, with that plan, which again, heading into the winter time right now, that's not the worst, uh, the worst plan anyways. And then also we would we prorate that if you want to upgrade or whatever. So, um, yeah, so you really start just watching the, that content. There's about six hours ish of tutorial content. I've got a couple. It's honestly, it's pretty crazy to me. I've got a one hour podcast with Zalatoris in month one of foundations that we recorded literally the, the day Kobe died. So it was February of 2020, right before the pandemic started, which is also then right before Will started going off just on and, and doing amazing every week that he teed it up. Right. Um, and then we also have another podcast in there. I think it's in month five or six that we recorded an hour long conversation with Will the week before the Masters this year. So it's like one was from a year and a half ago. Here's this kid's about to go off. And then the next one is this kid's going to finish second in the Masters next week here's what we're doing and here's what we're working on. And I think that stuff like that for young players to hear, it's like, this was a struggling junior golfer just six years ago. And, you know, now he damn near won the masters. <laughs> All right. Uh, Scott, we got a question coming in from Gus Vitale from uh, Philly. Uh, go ahead and unmute Gus. You ready to unmute? Hey, how's it going? Uh, thank you very much uh, for your help tonight. Um, Absolutely. I have a two part questions. Number one, I have a son, uh, he's 15. He's also, I, I think you mentioned this earlier, they tend to be a little, a little bit immature when they're playing golf, right? So when I, asked, when I told him about Deca golf, um, I said about uh, six, six, seven months ago, he was like, daddy, I heard about this. It's too, it's too conservative. I'm very aggressive. I like to go for the pain. So I, I, that, that would not work for me. So I'd like to know, number one, how do I answer that question? 
Number two. Let's, let's, th- let's take this in two parts because with uh, my COVID, I really am an idiot <laughs> right now. Part one is you literally explain to him that he does not have a functioning brain yet. I'm telling you, like, it, it, it's, it's I, and, I'm, and again, like, I used to be timid saying it that way, but yeah. it's really important that they understand. We're not saying you're dumb, man. We're just saying you can't make a good decision. And I honestly even say that to the, to the parents here listening to, like, you got to kind of laugh at it, too, sometimes because it's like... <laughs> I got a 12 year old daughter right now that's driving me crazy. And I've, I'm literally having to lean on what I'm teaching myself. Cause I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. How, how do you expect this to change if you don't do it something different? So I do think that explaining to him, okay, you think you want to be aggressive. Okay. Well, first of all, Tiger Woods was not aggressive. He did not fire at pins. Um, do you finish every round of golf? And I do, I do phrase it this way because I know everybody finishes every round of golf thinking they should have shot lower. And so what you tell them is like, do you feel like you should have shot lower when we finish? And his answer will be like, yes, every day. Okay. Then there's only one of two things that's possible. You're not as good as you think you are, which you won't like that one bit, or you make mental and strategic mistakes. And now let's go through the four shots you think you screwed off today. What were they? And they will be one of these five things. This is the, the Tiger Five. This is the stats that we track in the foundations program is how many bogeys did you have on par fives? How many three putts? How many blown easy saves, which for the app, we turn that into how many two chips? How many bogeys with nine iron or less? And how many bogeys on par fives? I can't remember if I said par fives or double bogeys first. Par fives, doubles, three putts, two chips, bogeys from inside 150. Those five things are f- the, 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 the five things are whenever he says I should have shot four shots lower, it will be one of those five. And those are the five things that Tiger was tracking in the late nine in the, in the late nineties, early two thousands, when he was figuring all this out on his own. And so you've just got to, you've just got to reinforce the kid. Like, I'm not saying you're dumb. I'm saying you don't get at making decisions. You do agree. You should shoot lower every day. And it is one of these five things. Decade is about cleaning those up. That's it. I mean, uh-huh. and again, it's a tough one because I, I do, I, I really wish that there was some sort of a time machine, not just because I would go back and not COVID, but I would like to go back to my 20 year old hard headed, just bleh, self and, and just talk to me like, dude, I'm actually you from the future. Like this is I'm not BS in here, man. This is how it works. I don't know if I would have been, I don't want to say mature enough or smart enough or what. I don't even know if I would have listened to myself. I, I do think that's right. the uphill battle, unfortunately, <clears throat> we're all up against is kids just, they don't want to. They don't listen. They hard-headed. They don't want to hear it, man. No, they hard-headed. I mean, yeah. Just, I just. I, yeah. I really, quickly, just quickly, the second part is. Do you have a list of certificate system? Do you have a list of we don't that? yet? Because I, honestly, the app, that's the point of the app. I've, I've definitely got a guy that's starting on January 1st. That's coming to work for me from the PGA of America. That's, that's going to be trying to build out a certified program. But I do think that this is what's interesting with any sort of teaching, you know, from this point forward in life, I, I do think that I'm really good at teaching this. And, and I do think that when you can sit down and just make four or five hours of content, like there's just no reason to have instructors recreated. And so my like tour instructors, guys like Jeff Smith and Mark Blackburn and Scott Hamilton, they're just like, I'm going to get the guy to hit the ball. And then I'm going to send them to you to teach him how to score. And that's really the way that I believe that it should be done because it's just not easy. I mean, Jeff Smith, the first time I met him, who he teaches Aaron Wise and Hovland and, you know, a lot of good, a lot of good players on tour. The first time I met him, he was like, I heard your seminar is four hours long. How can you talk about course management for that long? And I was like, honestly, it needs to be seven. And we had dinner and we went through this all right there. And he's like, I'm in, I'm not, I'm not ever trying to teach course management again. It's just going to (laughs) be this stuff right here because it is, it's a really simple system. It does take a little bit of effort, but Gus, I just, I think you've just got to tell your kids, like you tell me when you're done being frustrated with leaving shots out there. I mean, decades, not decade will be here the whole time. I mean, and it may take him a while. Um, trying to think of who it was. Oh, Sam Burns. I worked with Sam when he was a junior Mm -hmm. and he went off to college his freshman year at LSU and he didn't play very well that fall. He called me that spring. Wow. Or excuse me, over Christmas. He was like, I got to play more aggressive than this to win at this level. I'm like, you don't, but I'm not going to talk you out of that. Go for it. But you know, if you see that it's not working, 
don't be so proud. Call me back. I, you know, I won't hold anything against you. I'm, I'm a no grudge guy. And my phone rang that summer. He played a little bit better that spring, but my phone rang that summer. And he was like, dude, I see it now. He's like, I've made the same mistake a couple weeks in a row. He's like, without decade, I wouldn't have even been able to notice it. But because I understood what you taught, I at least picked up on the fact I'm doing the same damn thing every single day. Right. And he says, I'm all in. And then he wins seven times. And the Nicholas Ward is his, uh, his sophomore year in college and goes straight out to help them, you know, he's out on the corn fair tour. And, you know, the next PGA thing you know, tour. he's a PGA tour winner. Bam. Right. I mean, again, this is where it's hard because at the end of the day, I haven't worked with him, but I don't know, 10 hours in my life. So it's hard to be like, Hey, taking any credit. Cause there's other guys that have been with them. I mean, blood, sweat, and tears for years. What I teach just isn't that hard, but it is probably the most important piece. I mean, that's, what's kind of weird about it is it's just not that hard to understand what I teach, but it's really hard to actually do with any sort of discipline. I mean, again, that's why I use the words discipline and patience <clears throat> constantly on social media, because that is all that it is at the end of the day. Gotcha. All right. Any other questions? Uh, there's a, there's a tab on your uh, screen. You can raise your hand if you have any questions for Scott, any questions for Scott. There's a, there's a little raise hand button, y'all, on your screen. So let me know and I'll unmute you, okay? Or put some, or put a message in the chat if you got a question. Oh, we had a question. Oh, Sean, there you go. Okay, Sean, you're all set. Unmute your mic. Hey, Scott. Uh, sorry, guys, I got on a little late. I'm, I'm dog sitting. I got dogs running everywhere. Um, quick question. Um, first is a comment, um, met Sam Burns, his mom, when we were following him when he was at the, uh, on the corn ferry right before he went up. Um, she did tell me that they paid for college five times over before he got there. So that scares the crap out of me, but they didn't mention decade. So I'm, if I ever see her again, I'm going to say, why didn't you mention decade? Anyway, uh, I have a 12 year old. Okay. Is that, is that, and, and I, again, I'm sorry, I got on late if you covered this, but Good, is that the. I mean, we, we, we're ready to go. The sooner the better. Like, where are and we it's at? A, that's, a, that's a tough one, honestly. I, I, I think of it as a, I don't want to say maturity question because that's not it either. It's like a golf IQ thing. Like, right. I, I do think that you got to reach a certain level of ability. And I honestly, I don't work enough directly with junior golfers to have a clue what that number is. I think if you've got the ability, like not averaging in the 70s, but the ability every once in a while you're breaking 80, your golf IQ should be there to where like what I'm talking about makes sense. And, and the only, the best analogy that I've come up with is well, since I had COVID last year, I had a lot of blood heart issues and I did tons of blood work and got all these results from the cardiologist. Now, am I a cardiologist? No. Could I have a little bit better of a conversation about it than I could prior to learning all that from him? Yes. That's kind of what I think getting kids involved younger is like, well, are they ready to be a tour player? Obviously not. I and mean, well, it's funny because people have said to me before, like, well, if Zalatoris kind of had it all so early, why didn't he get on tour a little quicker? And again, not that he didn't get on there quick, but it did take him a season and a half or two seasons of kind of struggling. And I'm like, well, it used to be you would get all your physical skills and then you learned how to score. And then you were ready. We'll actually kind of flip that to where he, he, he has the physical skills with ball striking, but he still needed a ton of work on his chipping and putting. So, but then we subbed in all of the mental stuff before he got the physical skills, which is why he made his quantum leap from what's wrong with this kid to, wow, this kid is top 10 in the world. Yeah. But now like, okay, but he's still not a tour player. Well, now he's still got work to do on the rest of his game. So I, I do believe that if the kid can watch month one content, which it's about 40 or 50 minutes, maybe 60 minutes, and then the hour long Zalatoris podcast, I do think that it's for, for kids who love golf. I, I do think that it's entertaining content. Like if you like golf, you're going to sit down and watch it and be like, okay, yeah, like I kind of dig this. I'm not saying you're going to binge watch it like uh, Yellowstone or something like that, but <laughs> you're going to, you're going to watch it and enjoy it. But honestly, the reason I've broke it up in foundations is because too many people I do think binge watch it and then they don't really digest the information. Gotcha. So, you know, I think it's more of a question, a little bit of maturity, a little bit of golf IQ, a little bit of scoring average. Um, if they get into it and they're just like, this is overwhelming. Cool. Back off. Let it sit for a little bit. Honestly, always just send me an email. I'll just keep extending it out for you. It's not that big of a deal. Um, just 
get them to watch some content at their pace. But the most important thing is just when somebody says, well, I'm a field player or I want to play more aggressive than this. They just really, it, it, it is honestly, I, I come across pretty uh, abrasive on social media with dropping names and stuff like that. And I'm not doing it to try to sound cool. I'm doing it because I don't want the next kids to have to struggle for right. years and years and years. It's just not necessary. You don't want that but, either. Scott. We, 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 yeah, we, it's, can't, we can't afford it. It's just not necessary. I mean, it's whether you can afford it or not. Just It's just not necessary for this game to just be as brutal as it is. It is just a hard, hard game. That's true. Um, again, all, all games are hard at the highest level, clearly. But there's certain things that just they are aren't hard. Like I, I can still shoot a pretty decent jump shot. Now, I couldn't get one off with it at any sort of a, a college level player to save my life. But if you saw me on a court, you're like, oh, that guy knows what he's doing. I'm a 12 handicap at best. If you watch a 12 handicap at balls, you're like, wow, this guy, that's, they're hitting balls all over the place. It's just amazing how hard this game is yeah. on so many levels. And again, I do think that understanding and accepting that also makes it easier, though, because your expectations start becoming far more realistic. And, and I do believe that's everything. Again, the, the decade is just an acronym, and the E is expectation. Like that's, there were two letters that were intentional. I want these two words in the process, and it was expectation and discipline, mm -hmm. which is honestly the reason I tried decade first. Luckily, the whole acronym worked out because um, if it hadn't, it was literally the first word that I tried. And if it hadn't worked, I don't know what, uh, I, didn't, I don't think I realized how hard it is to make acronyms up. <laughs> right. And put the words with it, right, Scott? Yeah, yeah, just, right. man, it's... I think we got our next question coming in from Detroit. Uh, Kyrie, you there? All right, Kyrie? All right, I don't know if Kyrie's there or not. Kyrie? Okay. Um, we had a question from Gus. Gus, uh, go ahead and ask your question about lag putting. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, uh, quick question. Um, what distance do you consider is lag putting? Is that anything above 15 feet or 20 feet? What, what distance is that? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I would say 25 to 40 feet. But honestly, the, the, I, I hate that because I feel like you're trying to define if you're just trying to two putt or what there. And that's not really how I view it. So, you know, historically, when people say, how far should you hit a putt past the hole? The answer was 17 inches from a guy named Dave Pels. That's just the only answer to how far should you hit a putt past the hole? The only answer is how long's the putt inside 10 feet. You shouldn't leave too many short from 10 to 15 feet. You should start leaving 10 or even 15% short. And then from like 15 to 25 feet, there's this weird inflection point where, man, this uh, it's not very long, like a 16, 18 footer. You feel like shotgun blast. So you've got a depth to it. You know, so distance control it just at about 15 to 20 feet, it starts getting to where you need to literally leave 25 or 30% of your putt short in order to just not three putt too much. And it doesn't matter. You can't make enough putts to offset three putting again from inside about 25 feet. And that's again, how a guy like Zal Torres, he struggles on shorter putts. He doesn't do very well with them. But honestly, what's funny is it's just almost impossible to be more than 10% worse than like two or average. Like that's literally just impossible. And you just don't have that many short putts in that zone anyways. Um, it really does just come inside 10 feet, not many short, 15 to 25, 25, 30% short, outside 25 feet, literally leaving half your putt short. So you're just maximizing uh, how short you can make the average length of your second putt. Right. That is for sure. Correct. Especially at the junior golf level. So really rather than thinking um, where, what distance is lag putting, I would say just practicing like ladder drills where you're lagging around the prior putt. So you just progressively hitting six inch or a foot longer putts from, you know, 10 to 40 feet. Uh, there's again, in month two of foundations, there's a bunch of putting speed drills in there. That, uh, that, that Maverick McNeely and, and Jordan Spieth use a, a bunch. And so those, again, just trying to get players to understand more, more than anything, I'm just trying to get players to understand that it's speed, not your line. It really is where we just all get so focused on improving our stroke to improve our line. And that's just really never the problem. Your speed 
is a much bigger problem. And I know, I don't know how, if you guys put video out or not, but if you think of a breaking putt, if I have a straight eight foot putt, mm -hmm. really just the width of my shot pattern. So my line is kind of the only thing that matters for the make rate to a certain extent. But once you have a putt with any break on it, if right. you hit the putt softer than you intended, it starts breaking sooner. If you hit the putt harder than you intended, it starts breaking later. So even given the exact same start line and the exact same read, your shot pattern will become wider because of your speed control than even your start line. And I think that's a really hard thing for people to understand. But that's, again, going back to my game, this flag over here is from I played in the 1999 US Open and I was dead last in the field in total putts. Um, and my dad always told me I need to work on my speed more. And I just randomly rolled balls all around the green with no real intention or organization. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a guy that I, it's honestly almost like to be defiant. Like I, I'm against like drills. I just like practicing, <laughs> but I will now say, I do think that some speed drills because it gets you putting just the same 20, 25, 30 footer over and over and over again. And you'll start to get a little groove spot in your stroke. Right. where you're knowing these distances by, by length, not, not just by eyesight, but like, okay, 32 yeah. feet is approximately here. Yeah. I, I do think that's the best way to putt personally. I mean, again, there are savants like a Brad Faxon and a Ben Crenshaw who just get it, but that's not most people, but it is something you can train. And again, I was, I had terrible speed control when I was playing in my twenties, just because I never practiced it correctly. And now I don't even play much golf. As you can see in my back, I've got the simulator here. I've got a 30 foot mat that I can roll speed drills up and down it. Mm -hmm. I'm still a pretty, a pretty decent putter, even though I don't play much golf. And my only uh, putting practice is on a dead flat, dead straight <laughs> indoor 30 foot track. Cause you just get these little spots where you just kind of own, own it in your stroke. Right. Hey, Scott, got a question from the uh, chat line. Um, when you, when you, when you start the system, is there, is, should there be one shot shape that you focus on when you're swinging? Yeah. yeah I mean, I don't care if it's a draw or a fade. And I do think that it'll change over time. So Zalatoris, when he was a junior, he played this, <laughs> excuse me, sorry about that, stuck slingy draw. Um, you know, he wasn't strong enough to get the club in front of him to actually hit, a, a, you know, a fade correctly. Right. Um, so it will change over time as your body changes. But with the driver, for sure, you should only work the shape that thing one direction and straight's not a shape. You should either fade it or draw it, period. Right. Um, you see some guys that try to do it like a Rory and they are unicorns. I mean, there are, but that's like saying, you know, there's some amazing, you know, three point shooters in the world. Maybe I can be too. Like, well, you don't have to be. Um, it, it, it is just incredible how, how hard it is to shape the driver both ways. Now with irons, I'm a little bit less dogmatic about it, but what I try to tell people is I, I've honestly dug in on this so much over the last seven years that I really do only fade every single shot that I hit. Okay. And I'm still a plus five handicap. Like I'm pretty damn good at golf, even without playing much. And I do believe that the reason I am pretty good, even without playing much is because I only do the same thing over and over and over again. Gotcha. And once you do that, I mean, again, I'm not going to say it's easy by any stretch of imagination, but it becomes easier for sure. Yeah, and I guess easy is kind of relative no matter what. Like I could try to do a lot more stuff and I probably would, it would probably cost me a shot and a half around, but it would still, that people would still watch me like the game's so easy. Like, no, I'm making this harder than it needs to be right now. And it's actually costing me shots. Okay. All right. Good job, Scott. So, hey, listen, y'all, any other questions? Any last minute questions for uh, Scott? You can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and I'll get you unmuted, guys. So Scott, while we while we get ready to close out, man, uh, anything uh, anything you'd like to sum up to the juniors that are going to be listening to the podcast? Anything you'd like to uh, recommend or say to the audience? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I just feel like giving yourself a little bit of latitude to make some mistakes is, for, especially if you got kids directly that are listening, mm -hmm. like you got to kind of laugh at yourself because this is hard, man. It's so hard to be out there and not try to force things. And just see, you can see a shot be like, well, I can do this. Like, I know you can, but you're probably not gonna. Right. And, and that's okay. There's another way to go about this. And, and I think it really all comes down to, you can break a golf tournament down from, uh, you know, to win a three round event, we have to have the lowest 54 hole score. Well, we obviously break that down into three 18 hole rounds. You can break that further into six, nine hole rounds. You can break that into 54 one hole rounds. You can break that into 
Well, well, so if the goal is over 54 holes to beat your competition, you do that by shooting the lowest score. We all miss conflate. I don't think that's said correctly. We, we mess up right. uh, the fact that our goal is to shoot the lowest score basically on each hole, essentially on each shot that we can. And so it feels like in order to shoot the lowest score, well, I've got to make some birdies to shoot low. No, par on literally every single hole, but par fives, especially in junior golf, technically is going to gain you against your competition. You're right. So if a hole has a scoring average of 4.2, a par picks you up 0.2 shots. You're, you're making progress towards that amount of shots you need to gain overall against your competition to win. And technically, a bogey doesn't actually lose you a full shot. It loses you only 0.8 shots. It's just really important to look at it. And again, I, I don't want it to seem too mathy because it's not, especially for junior golfers. Um, but if you're just thinking about math class, like is four better than 4.2? Yes. If I make a bunch of fours and everyone else is making 4.2, eventually I'm going to, 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 to beat you. And so you've just got to get out of, you know, all these, these, I want to win. I want to win. I want to do this. I want to qualify. Just go out there and play good 54 holes. Make that actually just be, let's play a good hole. Right. Actually, let's make that, let's just play this shot correctly. And then let's play the next shot correctly. And it does sound very utopian and easy. Okay. It's not, <laughs> but it all, it, but it also is that easy. It's really hard to do, but it is that easy. Ultimately that is, I mean, again, that is what Zalatoris went from 3,300 in the world and thinking I'm better than this and so frustrated. And again, if you're frustrated with your results, you got to look at Will was literally 3,300 in the junior golf rankings, June of 2014. He was third in the wagger by December. Ooh. I mean, wow. That's a big I'm deal. not saying you're going to get to third and wagger, but if you feel like you're leaving shots out there on the course, I mean, this literally is it. I, I feel like that's the one thing that you just have to, as a junior golfer, just accept, trust, shove all in on and believe. And, and, and again, then just play patient, disciplined golf. Hey, last question, Scott, we don't let you go. Um, let's say uh, I got a question from the chat line. My son's a nine handicap. Do you recommend the uh, elite or the big boy? I would go with foundations. I would, I would have everybody go with foundations unless they're needing the yardage book feature. Like I would have everyone in junior golf start with that just because again, it's going to force you to, to learn the information over six months. Okay. I did just try. I know. I, I don't, I don't know what it is. I, I just tried the decade 75 a second ago over here and that code doesn't work. I'll, 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 I'll make know. that code. I'll, I'll make that good. But again, if you can email it out, but, but again, anyone ask, uh, ask him, I'll, I'm going to try to make decade 75 work, which will give you the, the six month foundations course for $75 instead of the normal hundred. And that will also. Six yardage. Yeah. I think Sean says it's decade. Decade 150. 150. That's, that's for the elite. I think the most of the elite is decade. 150 for sure that's a fully i think most of these guys will get the uh most of these guys will get the decade 150 scott but you you know if you if you get that code for the um these the smaller one we will put it out yeah I'll, I'll make that one work too and then you can go with whatever again if the kid's averaging in the 70s they're ready for elite i mean I, Again, it. I really do just hate feeling like a salesman. No, <laughs> either one's good. Either hey, one will be is, good. This is gonna help us. This is gonna help us, Scott. I, I think it's gonna really help us. And uh, man, I want to thank you for agreeing to come on the uh, podcast tonight. Um, Absolutely. I think you're gonna see a, a, a big jump in in what it is that we're doing. And uh, we got a message came in. I feel the answer was honest, Scott. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is funny. Like I really do. <laughs> I do hate feeling like a salesman. <laughs> right, right. No, man, we, we, we ready for, I think, you know, all the parents on here, we're ready for some change and uh, we want to see our kids do well. So again, we thank you, man. We wish you a happy holiday, Scott. Uh, thank you for coming on the podcast tonight. You got it. All right. Let me stop. Thank you for having me on, buddy.